Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Quick note for the podcast with Himender Barty on ants. Uh, He mentions that army ants worked with spiders. Uh, In fact, they worked with beetles instead of spiders. So he wanted me to make sure that correction was mentioned. Now on to the podcast. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius podcast. I have Dr. Himender Bharti. He's in the Department of Zoology and Environmental Sciences, uh, Ant Systematics and Molecular Biology Lab at Punjabi University, Patiala in India. So Himender, thanks for coming. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for talking to me from so far away. Um, yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Great. Tell me about your, your research, your work. <clears throat> yeah, in fact, I started with my research on sawflies. And sawflies, they belong to order Hymenoptera. And I described around 220 species in those among 33 were new to science at that time. And after that, I started working on ants because that was my passion to work on ants. And uh, <clears throat> that was way back in 1990 when I uh, was funded by Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. And that was a, a traditionally a sort of biodiversity assessment or taxonomic studies, which I carried. And uh, afterwards, I got a lot of funding from Government of India. And uh, I started expanding the research, which started with the traditional biodiversity assessment or traditional taxonomy. And uh, over the passage of time, we have come a long way since in uh, these last 20 years. And uh, during the course, I described about 100 new species of ants from India and other South East Asian countries, Vietnam and uh, China. <clears throat> so it has been a pretty a long journey uh, starting. And uh, this was my passion because... During my PhD, I was motivated, was inspired by Professor Edward Wilson. And uh, his work on ants is remarkable and his uh, personality to admire. So that was the starting point. So why are you fascinated with ants and what kind of ants do you you look into? I know there's lots of species, but... In fact, as you know, ants are social insects and uh, they represent the pinnacle of insect evolution, same as that of humans in mammals, and uh, their social organization, how they interact with one another, their developmental patterns, their life history, and uh, (coughs) their division of labor. So, so many factors which inspired me at that point of time. And second was that I'm very much interested in the evolutionary history of species which are currently inhabiting Himalayas as well as Western Ghats, that how these species got distributed, how they diversified in these regions. And uh, in India, we have a lot of endemism in Himalaya as well as in Western Ghats. And uh, second was that uh, nobody from India has worked at that point of time because the last recorded document was by Colonel Wingham. That was in 1903. And after that, there was not... Uh, you can say significant contributions from India and especially from Indian researchers. So uh, these were the reasons, but overall it was my passion which guided me or persuaded me to work on ants. So again, what fascinates you about ants is how they've changed over time or the individual abilities of each ant type? Like what's, you know, what are some specifics about things that interest you? Basically, their social structure, their reproductive biology, their social structure, how they interact with one another, how their life history starts and how that life history is guided by environmental factors and how what significant role do they play in the environment or in our ecology and what kind of evolutionary tendencies or trajectories are there in ants and how they have diversified, as I said earlier, over time. So all those factors and uh, pretty much I'm interested in their uh, as well as their life history, as well as their 
diversification in terms of evolution in terms of trades that how they occupy different niches and uh, of course their division of labor well tell me some specifics what what are some examples of ants occupying a niche that, that surprises you or again behavior or morphology or you know what are some specifics uh, especially for example we have number of ants which occupy different uh, niches different e- ecological conditions and they respond to different environmental factors for example uh, one of my favorite ants is uh, genus uh, they belong to genus marmica from himalaya and they are restricted to high altitude regions of himalaya and uh, are distributed mostly about 1200 meters in himalaya and they are distrib- their species are distributed in central asia as well as in other parts but mostly the himalayan species which i, I have been tempted to work upon they are they are basically most of them are endemic and their life history patterns are entirely different from rest of the stuff which we see in tropical regions because that life history is quite interesting and which me and my students are trying to work out to decipher that how these ants cope with a different set of hostile environmental conditions as in in you can say in case of ants which occupy tropical regions they have a sort of homodynamic life cycle that the life history is not interrupted by harsh changes of environment but in case of himalayan ants especially in case of marmica the life history is quite interesting and it is interrupted by uh, sort of hostile environmental conditions and uh, that l- interruption of life history how these uh, organisms or how these ants they respond to such kind of environmental interruption low temperature meager resources high altitude then uh, scarcity of you can say resources so that is quite important and their 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 life history what we are trying to elucidate is how how their genes are regulated in response to environmental fluctuations and what what kind of cutoffs are there which regulate these genes so we are looking into that also because in case of marmica especially <coughs> what happens when in case of high altitude regions the summer is very short so and the resources are meager so say it is say up to april end up into august that is the prime season for these ants and at that point of time a fertilized queen starts the life cycle by producing a brood which immediately changes into or transforms into rapid force of workers and those workers they Uh, try to maintain the colony try to maintain the offspring and finally by september again the temperature uh, it decreases and to such an extent that these are ants they undergo overwintering what we call hibernation in case of other animals and in during overwintering what we have recorded or what we have observed during all those years that the larval stages the third in star larvae they are spared but first and second in star larvae they are eaten up by workers then these ants overwinter with third in star larvae and next year when there is spring and uh, uh, resources are available at that point of time the workers and the queen they become active again and finally the third in star larvae which have overwintered they change into reproductive castes and by the end of you can say june that is the latest what we have recorded from himalaya so by the end of june the reproductive castes male and female they emerge then up to the end of august so as far as our record says up to the end of august this process goes on in different species and finally there is an nuptial flight and the fertilized queen overwinters but when it overwinters without workers and at that at that point of time it is quite interesting because these queens however they belong to different species sometimes they overwinter together breaking all those territorial barriers which are there in terms of different species and they overwinter together how do so queens Hello. of different ant species will overwinter together but what about when it's not in winter do the do the colonies mix or you know how do they end up together for the winter no no uh, the colonies do not mix and uh, only the fertilized queens they overwinter together and next year at, at spring they form different colonies or they lay eggs and sometimes the con specific uh, queens are accepted so that is a kind of situation and in case of marmica and in other ants also 
and there are a couple of examples where the colonies contain multiple queens we call that condition as polygynous so these are some of the questions which we are trying to work out or which we are trying to address that what kind of behavior and what kind of life history patterns allow this kind of uh, situation well, again how do they end, how do they end up wintering together do they how do they find each other and do they go into a common i mean where do they go do they burrow into the ground or where do they go no they burrow into the ground because in those places there is a snowfall by the end of october and the area remains snow cleared up to the end of march and uh, maybe in the april then snow starts melting then they emerge okay so they burrow into the ground but uh, are they together like in the ground right next to each other or they just happen to be in the same area or what do you mean uh, they they are in the same area because you know the nesting sites are scarce in those high altitude regions because the temperature is quite low and mostly if you go there during summer you will find that most of the nests are under stones and there is another interesting behavior which when whenever you you just pull off a stone and you find that uh, maybe during noon when the temperature is quite high you will find that the reproductive stages like larvae pupae they are at the top of nest just to get the heat from the sun through the stones and then afterwards by the evening they transport those reproductive cars to the lower sections of the nest so that is a kind of developmental strategy just to keep the reproductive stages warm and their metabolism work what kind of conditions are the queens in when they burrow into the ground is the ground what temperatures it gets and i guess they don't get snowed on or anything but um, no, no. how harsh they, are the conditions they they, they burrow down below be, below the snow they burrow down quite down below in the under the stones and then they maintain their temperature because they have some sort of fat reserve with them okay hmm it was interesting so these ants live way up in the himalayas like at what elevation like what's the what's up there yeah, that is quite interesting uh, the lowest recorded altitude is 1200 meters and highest what has been recorded from himalaya that is 4500 meters and what uh, my team has recorded that is up to 3300 meters there is a species marmica witmeri that we have recorded from 3300 meters so are these are these ants like in the highest elevations ever seen or what is the highest elevation where ants have ever been seen that is that is what i have told you 4500 meters yeah no, that's that's very high yeah yeah and temperature is pretty low oh well, what is it like 0 c or lower uh sometimes below 0 during winter it is minus 5 or 6 like that that is quite normal well wow. how do they yeah. survive with with wind conditions i mean it i'm sure it gets very windy up in the mountain wind that blow them away yeah that's a, again a good question because you know the reproductive casts are wind and uh, those reproductive casts they are blown away but in case of some of the species like which belong to genus formica they can fly away distances but in case of marmica distribution is not so wide as compared to formica that's why there is a great deal of endemism so if if they are blown away the question is that it should be the queen which should be blown away and that should be which which one is fertilized and uh, if that is blown away then we can have a different sort of nest at a different place and uh, that may add to the wide distribution but in case of marmica this is quite restricted because most of the time they forage <coughs> just above the ground so chances of being blown away are very less in case of workers but it it could be when there is a nuptial flight okay um uh, what what other kinds of ants have you seen that are very unique and unusual and and why are there any other interesting examples yes <laughs> and uh, continuing with my example of marmica we have discovered two social parasites in case of marmica and you know among ants these social parasites are rarely reported more than 1600 species which have been described up to now and uh, out of these only about more than 200 have been reported as social parasites so we have recorded two social parasites of marmica from himalaya if you like this podcast please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes and these social parasites are basically what they do these ants they capitalize the resources of host ants and sometimes they do not reproduce at all the queen will enter or live uh, with a host queen for a long time it will keep on uh, reproducing but producing only the reproductive cast multiplying itself 
but will capitalize on the resources of host and will not produce workers. But in case of uh, one of the species which we have recorded from Himachal Pradesh, which uh, uh, has been named as Marmika nefaria, uh, in that case, we got the reproductive costs and a fair amount of workers also. That was quite surprising. But when we compare the number of workers with the number of host workers, proportionately, the number of uh, parasite workers is quite low. That, that clearly depicts that parasite depends on the host for it is reprodu- uh, for its resources and secondly it is quite interesting now we have carried out the molecular work on these species also and we found that this parasite is uh, closely related to the host it means at some point of time they have diversified and one species which is related to the other that is the host has has become parasitic on this so this type of parasitism in ants is known as social parasitism because one social species capitalizes on the resources of other social species. So this is quite an interesting kind of behavior. And this type of social parasitism, which I have discussed with you in terms of in Marmika nefaria, that is the highest form of social parasitism. It gradually uh, started with some of the species getting resources from others, maybe plundering the resources of other species or their reproductive costs. But to live together is altogether different. So to live together, that is the highest form of parasitism, which we call as inculism. So that was quite an interesting find. Well, is it, so if they're living together with other, is it parasitism or is it mutualism or just, you know, are they just commensal where they live with each other and contribute together, but stay separate? I mean, What's no, it like? no, uh, yeah, it, it, it cannot be mutualism or it cannot be commensalism because the parasite is entirely dependent on host for resources. Isolated, such kind of isolated parasites have not been reported. But the morphology as well as uh, their, uh, you can say, behavior or their uh, life history that clearly depicts that their, their lifestyle is parasitic because they have got aberrant sort of morphology in in which we find that there are some traits which which clearly depict that they live inside the nest, they do not come out, and it is the host which have to provide resources, and on, the, on capitalizing those resources, the parasitic species has a tendency, just the purpose is to reproduce journey or to capital by capitalizing the resources of a host. It's not in return, it's not providing the host with any sort of sustenance. I mean, I've heard that ants can raise aphids, and they can culture fungus in like gardens. Yes, yes, yes. Use no, that is that is that is something uh, different. Far because that is in, that is in some cases could be obligatory association, but that is not social parasitism. That you can call mutualism. That is not social parasitism. When we talk in terms of social parasitism, as I said earlier, also in an elaborative way, that when a social species parasitizes on the resources of other social species then we call it as social parasitism. Yeah, no, I know those are different. Um, are there any instances of ants working with other creatures or other substances to cultivate, you know, like in addition to fungus and in addition to aphids? Are there any other creatures that, that ants uh, work and live with in this in the same manner? No, I, I don't think so. There are any sort of observations which we have seen during our study. But okay. there are there there are few ant species or spiders uh, which live together. That they are, those instances are there. Oh, oh, spiders and ant species that live together. Yes, recently there's a book uh, by uh, Do- Daniel Cranier on army ants, and they have reported that some of the spiders they are transported along with the ants, along with the trail of army ants. Hmm. Um, interesting. Do you know anyone that's have you looked at like the microbiome of ants? Or you know other aspects of them. Yeah, we uh, we are just starting to work on the microbiome of Burmica ants, and we we would like to see how those microbiomes have diversified, along with diversification of Burmica species. So we are trying to work on that also. We are trying to figure out that diversification also. Oh well, what has been found so far in the microbiomes of ants? Um, no, it's it's just and they have any unique, interesting bacteria in them. No, if from, in my lab, it's just a beginning, but there have been a couple of findings from Cory Murillo's lab in Chicago, and she found that these kind of bacteria, they have also diversified 
with the diversification of ants and sometimes those associations are obligatory also. Mm, okay. What else are you like what are you hoping to figure out about ants in the next year or two? Is there anything you're you're yeah. really hot on the trail of that's that's first in your yeah. research? We are trying to figure out phylogeography and uh, phylogeny of a couple of genera. We are working currently on Camponotus, which is a sort of hyper-diverse genus in India and world also. So in, from India, around 79 species have been reported so far, and we are trying to figure out how how this uh, how these ants have uh, colonized India and how they have diversified because their ranges are quite diverse. They are found in high-altitude ecosystems, in tropical ecosystems, then in northeast Himalaya, as well as in case of uh, western Ghats. So we are trying to figure out the phylogeography based on then uh, we are trying to integrate different approaches like molecular approaches with analysis of nuclear and mitochondrial genes, then integrating that data uh, with traditional morphology, morphometrics, just to work out and uh, trying to figure out the divergence time of these ants. That's another interesting stuff. And then we are working on another uh, army and that is Anictus on the same pattern. On just to work out how they have diversified a sort of biogeography. Then we are working on another end genus that is Polyrhychus on the same lines that how they have diversified. So such kind of and uh, then other kind of research which is going on in my lab. We are working on the reproductive casts of different end species. That how what are the evolutionary tendencies in different and genera in terms of uh, larval forms, that how those larval forms, whether they show any sort of deviation during the developmental stages, if we we test them across different and genera, which otherwise are distantly related morphologically in, in adults. So this is also going on and some of the students are working on uh, cuticular hydrocarbons. We are trying to work out how environmental factors they influence cuticular hydrocarbons and what kind of role do cuticular hydrocarbons can play in species delimitation. So a couple of uh, things are going on right now. Well, if you look at all the ant species, which ones are the most primitive or ancient and which ones are the most modern? And what's the difference, you know, how have ants changed, if you can tell, over the you know past however many millions of years? They, in fact, when we talk in terms of diversification and in terms of, you can say, diversification of lineages, it, it is not correct to say that what is ancient and what is advanced. Because if some lineage has survived over time, it doesn't mean it is primitive and the one which has originated recently, it is not advanced. So this kind of terminology is a kind of uh, erroneous representation of... Right, I didn't mean to say the newer ants are better, they're just different, but... No, no. What I really should have said is how are they different from ones that haven't changed over millions of years versus ones that appear to have changed recently? Well, yeah. Well, so the diversification started in Cretaceous around 145 million years ago. That is, the age is still debated, say 130 to 145 million years ago. And uh, that was the period when dinosaurs were about to disappear and angiosperms were on the rise. So that was the time and after that there was a diversification and during that diversification some of the modern forms they appeared and uh, some of the primitive forms are still continuing like we have some ants from Ponirini and some some of the genera are of recent origin and on other hand we have some of the genera like I talked talked about Marmika from Himalaya they uh, Their origin corresponds to Eocene and around 60 million years ago, what the fossil record says. And same is uh, in Ephanogaster also, another genus which is distributed in tropical and Himalayan regions. And uh, then Marmika, endemism of Marmika or diversification of Marmika, what we have found so far, that coincides with the formation of Himalaya. So it started around 145 to 130 million years ago. And it continued up to Pleistocene, that some of the species, Marmika species, which we have found in Himalaya, their diversification started in Pleistocene, that is, and say, four to five million years ago. And that is quite recent in terms of lineage diversification. But any any specifics in the ants that have, you know, stayed faithful to their, their form, their phylogeny for millions of years, how are they different from ones again that have changed recently? Are there any? There are changes in morphology. There are changes in their traits. Like in Ponidini, 
and there are changes in behavior also because you can see this this foraging has a, a change from solitary to collective sort of foraging so that those changes that solitary foraging was it uh, maybe ants have some sort of relation with solitary in terms of solitary for, foraging with wasp also so that kind of solitary for, foraging is there in some of the primitive genera but still the collective foraging started later on and some of the ponidini genera as i said earlier also they, they they represent as you said sort of ancient lineages which have, which have soldered on up to now and some of the genera which belong to marmesini and other sub families they have diversified as i said in in marmica also they have diversified quite recently but that diversification in terms of time does not mean that some are primitive or some are ancient or some are advanced that is same is the situation that if you compare say human species with other mammals which diversified quite early we can't say that those those mammals are primitive and humans are advanced so that is a sort of in terms of diversification not in terms of primitiveness or you can say advanced features is there any specific i mean are ants headed towards a different morphology or a different you know are they are they becoming more cooperative amongst themselves in their colonies or are they forging more relationships with plants and animals and insects etc like are they headed in a particular direction or you can't tell yeah the the leaf cutter ants the best example is that because you have already uh, said that they cultivate fungal gardens and uh, that is a sort of mutualism they have headed to that direction and uh, some have developed some sort of facilitative associations with plants as well as as we said earlier in aphids also so that that kind of situation is there okay i just didn't know if there's you know if in general you're seeing a trend where ants are headed towards uh, you know on a certain path or not so okay well, yeah okay in terms of i don't know commercial applications or medicine like you know how can ants be useful to to humans you know what are the big big things you see that we can learn from them or you know compounds they produce or things that they do that would be useful to people uh, uh, there's a lot of research, uh, bit you can say research has been carried out on this aspect also some are some are looking at the nutri- nutritional aspects of ants like what proteins or carbohydrates do they carry and then lipids and second is that uh, as far as medicines are concerned that is quite a known fact for example this uh, weaver ant oikophylla smargadina that is this is used in tribal areas and in china also in some of the southeast asian countries also they use those weaver ants in their soups and then they make the powder of these ants they use as medicine also and in some cases they have been reported as aphrodisiac also and in india also in uh, jharkhand i i had seen that uh, some of the tribals they use this ant for its medicinal properties they harvest the nests and then dry those ants and then they make the powder and then they use against many diseases like some infections then fever so such kind of medicinal value is there that is a sort of traditional medicinal value and have you ever like i don't know do some cultures eat ants have you ever eaten them like in, no, in new york no. well in new no. york years ago they had like chocolate covered ants you could eat i don't know what kind yeah, they were but i, I would I, eat them I, they were good yeah i've seen that but in indonesia and other southeast asian countries they do eat uh in the uh, larval forms as well as the pupal forms of these ants and use in soup also so that is quite common in southeast asia oh, okay interesting mm-hmm. well very good himender what's the best way for people to find out more about your work where can they go i have a dedicated website also you can find me there and if you can do a bit of googling by putting my name in the search you will find plenty of resources and then you can find me on ant wiki Oh, there's a site called Ant Wiki. Yes. Hmm. What's on there? What's the site about? Uh, it's, it's a it's a huge resource for all the pers- all uh, all the ant enthusiasts or nerds who uh, want to learn about ants. It is uh, it contains information about the uh, taxonomy, about the life history, about the species, about the genera, subfamilies. There's a plethora of information about ants, and that is a sort of you can say and developing as a good encyclopedia for ants that is if you go there you find 
different kind of scientists and then if you in the scientist page you can find their publications and if you go to life history you can find lot of information and some of the very good pictures of natural history and then as far as the morphological terms that it is it's quite a learning site for a beginner okay okay very good well himander thank you for coming on the podcast today. i appreciate it thank you thank you pleasure if you like this podcast please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.